Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled that uh, we could get together again. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, when the presidential elections come around, uh, I think uh, we got so deeply involved uh, in 08 that I think we just naturally think of each other again. Um, in uh, the case of the Rockwell Museum, uh, it goes on to greater and greater glories, uh, celebrating and appreciating illustration in uh, deeper and deeper ways. In my case, uh, I go on to um, see uh, what's possible in a world of my medium, which is that of the political cartoon. Um, and uh, the, uh, the existential crisis that the press is currently in forces us to re constantly rethink um, how the political cartoon and satire moves from the daily newspaper, which I don't believe will die, uh, but it is being um, added to by all kinds of other media. So instead of it being the, the only thing in town, you're looking at these covers by Norman Rockwell in a time before radio. In, in, the, in the 1910s, there was no radio. So what was the media? That, that was, that was media. You had your newspaper and you had uh, huge mass market magazines like The Post, like Collier's, and uh, just a, a handful of others. Now, uh, magazines are struggling to survive, but as a piece, a little much thinner slice of a pie that has, you know, BuzzFeed and uh, Twitter and uh, Snapchat and uh, ask any of these guys. I'd like to know what their media is. Uh, and I'll bet you in six months it's different. Um, so how do we continue to work? And for me, um, one of the big things that's happened is an appreciation of history. Um, because uh, the older I get, the more I see how events come around again. They replicate themselves. Not quite exactly, you know, as Mark Twain said, uh, history doesn't uh, repeat itself, but it does tend to rhyme. And uh, so by looking back at American history, uh, I think it's a really rich place for a political cartoonist to, to dig around and find things. Um, I think what we find is ourselves. Um, we find memories of what our parents and our grandparents went through. We remember the things that were talked about at home when we were growing up. People my age have a vague memory of the, of the McCarthy era, Cold War, Civil Rights era try to imagine a time before civil rights, uh, a time before we were aware of what we might be doing to the environment, um, and how the awarenesses of these things comes back uh, at, in different ways over and over again, um, but not quite the same. We don't experience politics the same way each time Ask Hillary Clinton. Um, so I'm going to show um, a few pieces by me. Uh, and, and I apologize if anyone's offended by how rude these pieces are, but that's what I do for a living. I, I make angry, outrageous, pissed off uh, portraits of politicians, uh, which is uh, about what uh, they have coming to them, I think. And, uh, uh, and so, uh, uh, and then, so after I show you uh, an example of what I've done as a contemporary of these men, uh, we'll go back, uh, talk about the president's project that I'm working on. And if anybody has any questions along the way, uh, we'll have questions after. But in the meantime, if you, if you have a, a thing you want to add or you want to correct me about something, uh, that'd be great. I'm not a historian. Please let me state that up front. I'm a cartoonist. I'm an illustrator, which means I take liberties. I make generalizations. I look for metaphors. I look for comparisons. I look for analogies and allegory. And that's our language. So this book is going to be a celebration not only of history, but of the power of the political cartoon and the caricature and how it has the power and the strength to be sticky in the mind, how to create an image that can really be the emblem of an issue, of an event, 
uh, that um, can help push the conversation forward. And that's really what I, I love. As every political caricaturist, cartoonist, really wants to be a part of the conversation. And I like getting angry letters. And I, <laughs> and I like getting angry Facebook posts. Uh, everything I do now goes up on Facebook. Anyway, we start here. Uh, a c contemporary caricatures of a bunch of presidents, because uh, I've been around that long. This was for the Washington Post. Um, Ronald Reagan, uh, just at the time when the Iran-Contra scandal hit, and those of you who don't know about Iran-Contra scandal, please look it up, because it was the moment when Ronald Reagan, who was this celebrated heroic president, uh, suddenly uh, faced criticism as he never had before. Uh, this is uh, an earlier, uh, homage to Mr. Reagan. Uh, he's a bull in a bull ring and the American people are being lured into war in Central America. Um, it happened but not as I thought it was going to happen. Uh, we did wind up supporting troops and uh, death squads uh, secretly until it came out that that's what happened. Here's a portrait of the next president, George H.W. Bush. This was done for the New York Times uh, magazine and his uh, endless struggles with the English language, which uh, his uh, uh, sons have uh, continued as a, an ongoing tradition. And then after him, of course, was uh, Bill Clinton. This was done for The New Yorker, uh, and um, uh, just at the time of the scandals, something else you'll find out about probably too, Monica Lewinsky, and uh, here he's on fire, you know, and, and, uh, I, and my idea was to have him uh, kind of imploding or combusting because of Hillary's gaze was just so searing that boom, he bursts into flames. Uh, my only New Yorker cover uh, called it Turkey Day. I guess this is in the category of the uh, impartial or equal opportunity insulter um, prior to the election. Bush and Gore would be in the Thanksgiving Day Parade as turkeys. Um, and behind them would be uh, Giuliani and Hillary, who, who at that time were rumored to be running against each other for mayor. Hillary wound up becoming senator, and Rudy wound up making a lot of money. When the rumor was that George W. Bush was going to run for president, Esquire sent me down to Texas to travel with his campaign for re-election as governor. So I spent a lot of, I spent 10 days with uh, Governor Bush and I liked him very much. He was, he was a very friendly, easygoing, sweet fellow. And it turned out, I, now when I watch the Republican debates this year, I have um, this feeling that none of the, can, I don't know if you agree with me, but none of the candidates in the Republican side have the skills that he had in terms of the ability to just seem genuine and real and respond. He, was, he had natural talent as a, pres, as a candidate, as a politician, that uh, I think he didn't get credit for in his time. And it's only by comparison that we see uh, how good he was at certain things. Uh, in his term, I guess, misunderestimated. And here he's riding a horse to victory, which looks strangely like his father. Iraq war, uh, things became surprising uh, in his administration. And here was a, an unforced error uh, going into Iraq uh, to disastrous effects. This was when I was doing a daily or a weekly by Luke thing for Rolling Stone magazine. Imagining him as Mickey in Fantasia, where he's chopping up the Saddam broom and all the little terrorist brooms. This is way before anyone ever heard of ISIS. And here's uh, a cover for The Atlantic on the Iraq War. Uh, James Fallows piece, uh, you broke it, you own it. And uh, an Obama for The New Yorker. Right away the press gave him a hard time which uh, I guess if you come to office being treated like the second coming of Jesus Christ, you'll have a hard time uh, dealing with, and he didn't like it. This was, uh, this was fun to do, uh, and the fellow on the right-hand side working for ABC was not Jake Tapper, but Jake Tapper called me and wanted the original because he was certain it was of him. And I, and I said, Jake, I'll send you a print. Uh, here's uh, <laughs> Hillary and Bill after a politics uh, schmoozing with a lot of famous folks. She may have overschmoozed herself. Uh, we'll soon find out. Uh, now we get to this year, and uh, still doing covers for the nation. In fact, I'm doing one, another Trump uh, tomorrow for them. Uh, here's Ted Cruz, uh, an analysis by Rick Perlstein on 
the history of uh, Tea Party-like folks in the Republican Party. So it's Ted looking especially seductive, I think. Uh, <laughs> Jesse Helms, Reagan, Grover Norquist, uh, Gingrich, Barry Goldwater, and Joseph McCarthy, who is uh, his true spiritual leader, I think. Chris Christie, who unfortunately we've lost now. Um, this was uh, as he began his bid, uh, falling off the George Washington Bridge a la Humpty Dumpty. Uh, and uh, all I can say is, watch out Washington Heights. It looks like he, he's headed right for you. Uh, another failed uh, GOP candidate, um, Scott Walker. Um, the idea of uh, the friendly guy uh, with the real Paul inside who pops out every once in a while. You've got to take a quick picture of it so you catch it before he vanishes once again. So I think this applies to all kinds of candidates, not just Scott Walker. I think most of them have the little lurky thing behind them. In fact, I think this is a motivating factor behind my book. I don't think there are any of the presidents that are all one thing or another. The finest presidents you can think of, Washington, Lincoln, FDR, all have stuff. You know, they all have, there's always something like Lincoln and habeas corpus or FDR and the shenanigans leading up to Pearl Harbor and then the rejection of refugees <clears throat> and a lot of political stuff under the table. Steven Spielberg made that film about Lincoln where it shows him being a very crafty Paul to get the 14th Amendment passed. So this doubleness is what we love in illustration. Uh, it's what I teach. I teach illustration at School of Visual Arts. And it's this idea that we look at one thing and the illustrator can ask the question always, well, what's behind it? What's the second life of a thing? So as you guys, especially you young folks, look at the illustration. Look at any illustration, mine or especially the master, Norman Rockwell. He's the greatest, in my opinion, the greatest illustrator in American history maybe the history of the world, for a lot of reasons. We could, I could do another talk. Uh, Stephanie, you can ask me back to do another talk on my appealing, opinions of Norman. But it's about this doubleness, OK? It's about what we see and what's behind the thing. And if you look carefully at each one of these, there's always that. There's the thing that's on the surface, and then Norman is giving us the little extra story. What I tell my students is the dream. In every story, there's a dream, and it's your job as an illustrator not, not that I'm assuming you guys are, but if anyone is thinking about narrative, find out what that little inner life of every character or every story really is. All right, we're getting closer to the bone here. <laughs> this is for the LA Times, and I did a piece about what the GOP could do to get Trump. Because they were worried about, like, the establishment is still very worried that... Uh, what, what's going to happen? They nominate? Can they nominate this guy? So I thought, I came up with about six ideas, and one of them was a previously unreleased photograph from Trump's wedding of this event happening in the closet. Uh, Trump has been a great source of income for me this year. This was for Time magazine. It was meant as a cover, but it wound up inside. And to me, it sort of says it all, how you can be uh, a self-promoter to a very great extreme. And he's still, he's still ahead in South Carolina, although slipping a little, I read today, and nationally still substantially ahead. So now we get to history. My interest in the presidents and history has spilled over into my work for publications. So for the anniversary of the JFK assassination, I did a full page for The Atlantic. They had a special issue, and I did the back page. I noticed that uh, the footage from Dallas that I found on YouTube showed a sunny day, November 22, 1963, where the reception for Kennedy was, those of you who are old enough to remember this, was like to, for a returning hero. It, it was in a red state to see people lining the streets 10 deep waiting for the presidential motorcade. And up until 1230 or 1229, it was maybe the best day of his administration in terms of an outpouring of love and respect in a state that he was kind of shaky about winning. He was there to shore up his support for 64. He was going to run against probably Barry Goldwater, he thought. And uh, here was a state that was not too friendly to him. And boy, it was an amazing turnout. And the last words were Mrs. Connolly said, I guess, 
Mr. President, you can't say now that Texas doesn't love you. And he said, I guess you're right. And that was about a second and a half before the end. So what I caught in this story was those last hours and shots like this. And it blew me away because never again would a president wade into a crowd like this. And this happened, this is a shot from Love Field when the plane lands. And if you remember, Mrs. Kennedy receives a bouquet of roses. And he just goes out into this crowd. And I'm thinking of myself, looking at this footage, like, are you crazy? Presidents don't do that anymore. This was the last time. I'm very grateful for your attention. And if you have any questions I'd be, or comments or criticisms, I'd be delighted to entertain them and just chat about uh, this or that or American politics, the presidential campaign today, or anything you'd like to talk about. <laughs>